Okay, everyone, here we are back in chapter nine of AR 105. Um, I'm Professor Giles, and we'll get going talking about Leonardo da Vinci. Um, but to talk about da Vinci, we have to think about his teacher, and that was Verrocchio. And here's a bronze statue that he did of um, Coleone, and this is in Venice. Uh, this is the first grand equestrian bronze statue since classical times. And it really was taken on um, the idea of this image and others of Marcus Aurelius that's down in Rome. So Verrocchio was a master bronze caster and sculptor. He also sculpted this David, which is somewhat controversial to my students uh, many times because it's so effeminate and we just don't have the time to argue back and forth and discuss it. Um, but it is David from the Bible. Here's Goliath's head that he's very proud standing over it. And remember, he's 12 years old, so he's not a full grown man, um, but we really can't discuss it at this point. But here's a painting by Verrocchio. And this is an important painting, not because it's the most wonderful painting of all time, which it's not, obviously. Hopefully you can see that. But we have John the Baptist baptizing Jesus, Holy Spirit coming down out of heaven in the form of a dove, the hand of God, uh, blessing the event. And then we have two angels over here. Now, even though Verrocchio is a master, one thing I want you to understand is he had a studio, and not to go into all the detail, but within that studio, there were oh, maybe 20 or so boys and young men who were his students. And the very young students, eight, nine, 10 years old, were creating tools, learning craft, but they're not drawing, they're not painting, they're just learning from those who are older and from the master. When they're about 12 years old to 16 or so, they might be able to start drawing, learning how to draw, learning how to paint, how to do different techniques. And then about 18 to 20 or so, then they could start, could start creating their own work, but not their own, but they'd be helping out the master to do things that were just too tedious for him to work on. So that's what we have here. On the right, we have Verrocchio creating the head of John the Baptist. And then on the left, we see an angel head here that's very different. Now, it's subtle. Okay, I understand that. And it took me actually a few years to see it. But the brushwork on the hair here, on the skin tones, um, the, the shading is different than over here. Look at the hair and how detailed it is. If there's darks, there's medium tones, and then highlights, really bringing out those curls. Nothing like that is here. Look at the skin tones and how they're created. They're not splotchy like this. So a different artist created it. And most art historians would agree that this was Leonardo creating at least the head of the angel, maybe the whole body of both angels, and some actually believe the whole background. Well, we don't know that. So um, because he was a student, and the evidence shows that he was only about 12 or 13 years old, he really was a child prodigy. And as we'll go through the rest of his work, Leonardo, um, he was really excellent at what he was doing from the very start and all through his life. Uh, all kinds of stories we can talk about and, and stuff like that, but that's for later. Okay, um, so talking about Leonardo, we know that Leonardo is a great artist, a great draftsman, meaning a great drawer, a person who draws some of his hands from his sketchbooks. We know that he did volumes and volumes of work from dissections where he was actually able to uh, open up the human body and see the muscles and bone and all kinds of different things that really artists had not done 
uh, if ever, even in antiquity, trying to see the structures underneath. Um, here's a piece of a raging horse rearing up, and it, he's trying to show the action. This is almost like a stop action image where you have several hooves and legs up in the air in different stances, but this is showing what's moving, but what is standing still. So the rump of the horse is standing still and the rest of the movement is elsewhere. Okay. So after he came out from under Verrocchio, he started creating his own work, but it's still in the style of Verrocchio. This looks very much like Verrocchio instead of Leonardo that we see later. But very quickly he starts to create his own style. Um, this almost looks like who? Almost like the Mona Lisa. Look at these curls. That looks a lot like the curls on that angel. Madonna and child. I just love this baby. He's so such a chunk. Here's a piece. Um, girl with ermine. Uh, here's a piece unfinished. He's very famous for having unfinished pieces uh, for many, many reasons. Here's another unfinished one. This is a horrible image. This is actually really cool. Um, the oil or the, the color has not been applied, but how he painted, he painted all the darks first and then would build it up, build it up, and then add color at the last step. Now, here's a cartoon, which is a preparatory sketch for a piece of artwork. And this I've seen, and I believe it's London at the National Museum. And it's probably about four or five feet tall. Um, it's massive and it really is wonderful to see his actual hand, the actual pencil lines. And there's a, a maybe a myth that he created a huge gargantuan horse out of bronze. Uh, we don't know whether he did. Um, this one is a conceived copy of what it might have looked like. This is in Grand Rapids up in Michigan. Um, if he did build it, it was uh, torn apart and made into cannons during a war um, after it was made. But again, we have no evidence that it was actually created. Here's a piece um, that he did for, a, uh, I believe, a monastery for the church. Um, he did a lot of work within the Christian theme even though there's no evidence that he was a, quote, believer, um, maybe agnostic at best is what we would call it today, uh, very much a scientific mind in some ways. So um, the monastery orders this, or the convent orders this, but they reject it. It's the Virgin Mary, John the Baptist, Jesus, and an angel, an altarpiece. But they don't like it because it's not churchy enough. So what's he do? He creates a whole new one. And how does he churchify it? He changes a few things like hair on Jesus, gives him a halo, better wings on the angel, uh, changes her face a little bit, put the cross-shaped cross shepherd's crook with John the Baptist, which is his symbol, halo, halo. But these are almost identical. Um, one of the cool things about this is one is in Paris, one is in London. So you can see one in the afternoon, take the, I'm sorry, in the morning, take the channel train, go underneath the English Channel and see the other one in the afternoon. Uh, they're that close and you can really compare it. Um, and again, these images do nothing for the real one. So let's get to the meat. Um, the Last Supper. Now, I love to show images like this of the space that the image is in. Okay, a refractory, which you see here, is the cafeteria for the convent. So imagine this room being full of tables at lunchtime, and who would they be having lunch with? Well, Jesus and the gang. There they are. So it's this very special thing, and this is not the only Last Supper ever created. There are hundreds of Last Supper paintings and frescoes around. This is a fresco, and we'll get into... Um, that in a minute, um, this little thing in culture, we came very close to losing it. This area here between the wall and the red line, this is what we were just looking at. 
and some British bombs almost destroyed the Last Supper during World War II. So the roof was destroyed, the wall was destroyed here, but behind the structure, thankfully, they had built this to protect the piece of artwork and we didn't have it destroyed. But everything that you see here, that this white of the ceiling and this wall was totally gone, all the way down to here was destroyed. So very thankful that that did not happen. So here's the piece. Now, one of the things about it is this is before restoration and recently it was restored. This is a fresco. Now a fresco is supposed to be made on wet plaster that's applied to the wall, several layers, and then while it is still wet on that last layer, vegetable paint or watercolor um, is applied to it so it, the pigment actually goes into the plaster and when it dries it is part of the plaster. But Da Vinci trying to be a scientist and make things better, he actually used oil along with other paints because oil is this new technology up in northern Europe. But what do we know about oil and water? They don't mix. So even though it looked good when he finished, within just a few years, pieces started falling off and it was in horrible condition. So just recently they conserved it and now it looks uh, like this, which is okay. It's a little bit better, but there's a lot of controversy about it. I'll let you look online, read books about it. Um, some people really hate it, but that's okay. Um, it's still there. We can see it. We can actually see some, some new things. So let's look at what's going on here. Why is this special? Uh, why is there all the gaga um, within the art world and the world in general about this? Why is this a great piece of artwork? Well, this is what other Last Suppers look like. This is by Castonia. And we've got Jesus here in the middle and the white lines I'll talk about in a minute. But it's really, it's very staid. It's unmoving. Okay? Um, very formal. And who's the bad guy? Well, of course the bad guy is Judas and he's right here with black hair and he's on the other side of the table. Okay? So the tempo here is very regular and boring. What does Leonardo do? He creates activity. So within the story, Jesus says, one of you are going to betray me. And there's ripples all the way on each side of the table. So we have sets of three, three apostles talking to each other, three apostles, three apostles, three apostles. So he puts them into groups instead of individuals. And look at their hands. Every single one of them has a different gesture. Um, I love this. It's putting up the hands. Well, it's not me. This guy's coming up and out of his chair. Well, it's not me. Here's Peter asking John, what did he say? Who is it? But here is Judas. And what did Jesus say? Who I dip the bread with is the one that betrays me. Jesus is reaching for a piece of bread. Who else is reaching for a piece of bread? Judas. Jesus in the middle, there's that hand again with that finger pointing up to the sky. More gestures here. Okay, so really that's one of the main things. Also the perspective is so cool. There's a halo around Jesus without making a halo. It's actually built into the wall. Um, so there's lots of things to say. Um, Everything that you see on the table is actually accurate for Leonardo's time. The type of utensils, the plates, the food, there are actually eels out there that were quite popular during Leonardo's time. Um, but real quick, 30 seconds or less, the Mona Lisa. Actually, I don't really like it that much, but I appreciate it. Here you go. Um, the Sfumato, this is one thing he's famous for, is this sort of fume sort of painting where there are no dark lines between areas that it really is smooth. And if you go to see the Mona Lisa, expect the crowds. They're everywhere and she's behind glass. 